Good morning and welcome to Easter Sunday at Church in the Valley. I'm really glad you joined us here online. This Easter is very different than I expected it to be. Who would have thought that I'd be delivering the Easter message here from my living room? But hey, that's the way it is. Life has changed drastically for all of us right now. And we're starting a new message series today that we're calling This Changes Everything. And it feels like everything has changed right now. Uh, we go through landmark moments in our lives where we experience something like the COVID outbreak, and it feels like everything is changing, and we'll never quite see life diff the same way in the future. This is a strange season of shutting down, slowing down, socially distancing, scouring stores for everything we need. For well over a month, we've watched the virus sweep across the world in this pandemic that we're experiencing. And we're often told that God is irrelevant. But in times like this, in times of crisis, we seek him out. We reach out for him. That's what's been found in a study that USC did recently that shows how we're responding to the virus and what we're doing differently. And the title is Eat, Pray, Wash. This chart shows what Americans have done since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak. 85% are washing their hands more frequently. I certainly am. <laughs> My hands are getting chapped. 61% have socially distanced themselves, and I would imagine that number is higher now because this was done a few weeks ago. And then 50% of us have prayed since the crisis started. I predict that prayer number rises the longer the crisis continues because 77% uh, of the people in our country pray at least monthly. That's shown on this chart. The current of our culture says that God is irrelevant, but we don't live that way. People everywhere are looking for meaning. Something in our hearts draws us to seek God in a crisis like this. If there's more to life, we want to know it. We need to know it. If there's hope to be found in knowing God, we need to know that. We need to be sure of that. So I would imagine that right now, most of us are more open to seeking God, seeking to know Him, seeking to find the hope that flows from knowing Him. For some of us, we're seeking because we're afraid of death or illness. For others, uh, others of us, we, we've just got extra time on our hands, and that draws our minds to eternity and to matters of purpose and meaning, and so we're just thinking more. This unseen virus has made us feel much more fragile and vulnerable than we normally do. If you aren't yet a Christ follower, you may be investigating Jesus more than ever right now, and I hope you are. If you're already following Christ, you're looking to deepen your faith. I know that God uses experiences like this to deepen me and my faith and my trust in Him. God wants our questions, our fears, our concerns, our brokenness to draw us to seek Him out. If you came to know the hope that God gives in Christ during this crisis, what a great outcome that would be. Whether it's for the first time you experience the love of Christ and the hope that He gives, or uh, you know him already and you deepen in your faith in the hope that God gives. What a great outcome that would be. Easter is about the good news Christians have carried since the time when Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected from the dead. The resurrection is compelling evidence that God is real and that Jesus is real. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul summarizes the core of the Christian message, and he also lays out one pretty compelling piece of evidence for the resurrection. 
Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And there you have the heart of the Christian message. And then He gives some compelling evidence for the resurrection. And that He appeared... So Christ died, he was raised on the third day, and he appeared to Cephas, or Peter. Then he appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Basically, the evidence is real people saw Jesus live, die, and then rise from the dead. That's pretty amazing evidence. Peter is the first person listed here uh, of those who saw the risen Jesus. And he was a fisherman. Here's a picture from a screenshot from a crowdfunded TV series called The Chosen. And I, I really love the way that Peter is portrayed in this series. I think it's pretty accurate. It's the way I could see him being. Um, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, what he did was he called Peter to follow him. Peter leaves his fishing nets and follows. Now, Peter waffled. He didn't, he didn't remain totally faithful to Jesus at the end during his trial and crucifixion. He waffled in his faith and who Jesus was but he became convinced after Jesus appeared to him alive after his crucifixion. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is at the end of this list, and it's interesting to think about James growing up with Jesus. I wonder what he thought the first time he heard that his big brother claimed to be God. I would imagine that made a lot of sense to him because they were from a poor family. I'm sure they probably shared a room at times, and he had a close-up view of a very perfect life, well-lived. And so I bet that made sense to James when he heard Jesus claim to be God. Here's a fun routine uh, from Michael Jr. about what it must have been like to be James, no, to be Jesus' little brother, James. I like reading the Bible. I was reading the Bible. Found out, uh, found out Jesus had a little brother. Anybody know his name? James. When I read that, I was like, Phew. how much pressure was that? <laughs> Jesus, your big brother? How many times do you have to hear, why come you can't be more like Jesus, James? Because <laughs> you know, everybody probably thought that James could do the same thing Jesus could do, but he couldn't. He was just James. He wasn't James Christ. <laughs> Remember the wedding banquet? Jesus turned water into wine. Everybody was amazed, but they don't tell you about the next banquet. Jesus left early. They started running out of wine. Everybody looked at James. <laughs> it's like, man, last time this happened, your brother made some wine, dude. You, you just gonna stand there with your sandals on? You're not gonna... <laughs> Can you make some Kool-Aid or something, man? You're not gonna do anything. That's a pretty fun video, but take a moment and think about how compelling the evidence is that Jesus' little brother James followed him to his death by stoning. He was stoned to death for his faith in Christ. Now, I love my brother, and I really respect him, but if he claimed to be God, I'd know that he is lying and I would never follow him to death. That just wouldn't happen. These men and the first women that followed Jesus were just the beginning of the Christian movement, and it continues in a powerful way today. I'd like to share an example of that right now with you uh, from our own congregation. Amy Kirkpatrick, a young mom, in our congregation, 
recently suffered a serious heart attack. Her husband, Justin, uh, just he wanted to come by the office. This was a few weeks ago when it was okay for him to come by the office. He wanted to come by the office and do a quick video update of what was going on and to thank the congregation for the way that we had really helped and pulled together and loved them during this time. In the first part of the interview, I just asked Justin what, what happened. And so he shares it here. Let's listen to this. Hi, I'm here with Justin Kirkpatrick, and he wanted to have an opportunity to let you know what's been going on, what's happened, and give you an update on Amy. Justin, what, what happened, and what's the update? So uh, on Monday, um, Amy wasn't feeling well. And, uh, and I was at home uh, because everything had been canceled. Um, and she, uh, she, she had some weird feelings in her chest and in her shoulders and in her back. And, um, and she said, you know, should we go to the emergency room? And I said, well, you know, I actually was a little frustrated at that point because I was trying to finish a work meeting. And I said, uh, I'm not sure. And anyways, uh, it ended up occurring to me, I think by the grace of God, I really do, that we need to go. So um, I drove her to the emergency room at Kaiser where uh, they discovered she had some stuff going on and that's also where she suffered two very serious heart attacks. The next thing is I asked Justin to share how he and Amy both experienced God's love and work through this time. So it's it's been, what was really amazing was that I was home um, because of the whole coronavirus thing. And it's very scary. I understand that. And I know it's something that I'm thinking about ahead now. It's going to be more serious for us with Amy and her heart condition now. But because of that, I was home. Had that not been the case, I wouldn't have been home. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if she would have gone in and she said, probably not. Mm -hmm. So she would have been at home and she was seized up at home. And I don't know what would have happened. Mm -hmm. But God really put things together. He orchestrated things so that we could get her the help that she needed. Yeah. So that she's alive right now. Yeah. And I just watched God work in those. And, and then Randy came and got me at the hospital. And, and and that was really helpful. And we talked and we prayed. And the doctors and the nurses really moved quick. And she got to San Antonio, which is one of the best cardiac hospitals in the nation. It's top 50, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so it's really amazing how that all transpired. Yeah. And so to just to see God work in all those things and in a great tragedy and continue to work. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of the coronavirus, yeah. God even used that situation to orchestrate and arrange sovereignly yes. for you to be home and yes. to, to make that call. And finally, I asked Justin to share the hope he's taking away from this experience and from God's help and presence as God walked with him through this time. Um, the first thing that's been encouraging, and, and I just want to say to everybody at the church who's been praying and, and giving us up the outreach from the church, and the people who love and care about us in a time when toilet paper's worth its weight in gold have even given us toilet paper. I never thought I'd send a picture to my wife of toilet paper with you know excitement and glee, like, check this out. But it's I did, and it was a huge blessing. And so people just giving and loving. And a lot of people aren't giving and loving right now. But to see the church shine like a light and do that for its people. And then I also have been reaching out to folks for prayer and advice and wisdom. I've been very discouraged at times. There's part of the times I just wanted to think really terrible thoughts and give in to fear and worry and anxiety. Uh, and, just, and just curl up in a ball and not do anything. But God has used the people from the church like Randy and other folks really encouraging the scripture. And so here's some of those scriptures that have been really helpful. And I shared those with my wife, Amy. You guys know Amy. And she's also really struggling through discouragement right now. She's very afraid some, some of the time. And I understand why. Um, and, and these verses have been so helpful. Psalm 42, 5. Why are you despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My hope isn't in health 
It's not in the, the, the bank account or the things that I have. My hope isn't even in my wife, who I love dearly. It's in God. And, 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 and he gives and he takes away. And he's sovereign. Mm-hmm. And that's where my hope is in these crazy times. And then Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Psalm 18, 1 through 3, I love you, O Lord, with all my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Mm. And I've watched the people at church put their faith in God and not on their stores of toilet paper and not on their stores of paper goods and other things like that, to watch them put their faith in God and reach out and help one another and been so blessed by it and seen God work in that because our hope isn't in these things. Mm. Our hope is in the stock market. It's in God. And God's going to see us through. When we go through something like Justin and Amy went through and are going through, really, and when we're in the middle of a crisis like this, we need hope and confidence that someone is in control in the middle of the chaos. We can know. I, I can tell you that we can know that God is with us and he's working out his sovereign plan for us in times like this. And he brings the church together to encourage us and to remind us that he is the one that we can lean on. He is our hope and we can walk with him through these times. And that is a tremendous comfort and a a tremendous hope that we have in Christ. We put together a Discovering Faith Forum video that you can view on our website if you'd like. In this video, you'll hear some testimonies about how some of the folks, some of our members in our congregation have decided to follow Christ, what drew them to Christ, what made them decide to follow Christ. And then you'll also hear the core message of Christianity spelled out. And so if you'd like to decide to follow Christ as well and commit your life to Him, That'll give you the information you need to do that. And if you'd like to receive this video, uh, then you can let us know on the connection card below and check the box, Discovering Faith Video, and we'll email you a link to watch that video on our website. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote about the impact of Christ's death and resurrection for our lives in a very practical way. As we wrap up the message today, I'd like to walk through a couple of differences it makes if we yield our lives to follow Christ, just as Peter and James did. I'd encourage you to read through the entirety of Romans 7 and 8. Those are some of my go-to favorite chapters in the Bible, and there's a real help there in them. But here's what we find in Romans 8. When I yield my life to follow Christ, first, I have a hopeful future. Romans 8, 24 through 25 says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. When I yield myself to follow Christ, I tap into the hope that God gives for living life. This is what Justin was talking about in that video. It's what you and I can experience when we give ourselves to follow Christ. Second thing that happens is I see life differently, no matter what I'm facing in the moment. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God uses everything for the ultimate good of those who love him, no matter how bad it is. In the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at how the resurrection and a relationship with Christ changes everything about our lives. It changes the way we find happiness. It changes the way we deal with unmet expectations. It changes the way that we handle discouragement. 
If we follow Jesus, we aren't dependent on our circumstances for hope in this life. We can trust Him, and our hope is in Him. Paul continues in Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? No virus or disease or economic downturn or spiritual darkness or loneliness will ever separate us from the love of God because he is right here in the world with us, willing to walk us through this. COVID-19 has changed much about our world, but the good news is, the great news is, that Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection gives us what we need. It gives us the power we need to find the hope that we can have in Him that anchors us to hope in the midst of this adversity. Lee Strobel was an atheistic investigative journalist whose wife decided to follow Christ at one point in his life. And his response to that, he reacted by setting out to prove that Jesus was a fake. Uh, a movie was made of Lee Strobel's life and investigation of Christ. It was released in 2017. Here's a clip where his boss, who was a Christian, challenged him to use his investigative skills to weigh the evidence of whether or not Christ was who he said he was. Let's watch this together. One of my heroes was C.S. Lewis, a man who began as a skeptic, much like yourself. At the end of his journey, you know what he said? He said, if Christianity is false, it's of zero importance. But if it's true, there's nothing more important in the entire universe. So you want your wife back? Well, hey, guess what? People in hell want ice water. Not everybody gets everything they want. Stop blaming me and the church and God and do your job. Stack up the evidence, follow the facts, and write the story, win or lose. Strobel ended his search by giving his life to follow Jesus Christ as boss. This movie's for rent, and I'd encourage you to use the extra time that we all have right now to watch it. It would probably be very enlightening to you. If you're not yet a Christ follower, I'd like to encourage you to weigh the evidence for the resurrection. Lee Strobel's written some books that are a real help if you're wanting to weigh the evidence. One of those books is called The Case for Easter. If you check the box on the connection card, we'll send this book to you on Kindle. As I wrap up the message this morning, I'd like to encourage you to make it a priority to weigh the evidence for the resurrection. There is no more important decision than you could make than to give your life to follow Christ as boss and to find the hope that comes from knowing him and walking through life with him. One way to explore uh, that evidence, one piece of evidence, is the testimonies that you'll hear on the Discovering Faith Forum video. So you can check that box on the connection card below and we'll send you a link to that video. If you're ready, and you may be ready, maybe you've had all your questions answered. Maybe you've been investigating Jesus Christ for a while. Give your life to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and boss and Savior right now. Accept Him as the Savior that He wants to be in your life. Turn to Him and give yourself to follow Him. Let us know if you have made that decision or if you want to make that decision. Let us know on the connection card below and we'll send you some help and we want to encourage you in it and that would be great. I'd like to wrap up the message by declaring Romans 8, 31 and 32 together. It should be on your screen. Would you read it with me? 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And of course he will, if we trust him, if we give our lives to follow him. And I hope this message has been a help to you. If it has, would you share an invite to your family or friends to join us next week online when we talk about how a relationship with Christ changes our approach to happiness. It really does. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the hope we have in you, for the love that you poured out in the person of Jesus Christ, and that you are willing to pour out into our hearts and lives. Help us, God, to find the hope we have in you. Help us to do what you've laid on our heart to do as a result of this message this morning. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for that first Easter morning when you rose from the dead, Lord Jesus. Help us to live in the hope of that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.